this one, um, our rules for this test, the Nixon test, there won't be any corrections. Um, but I do still need to add those bonus points for that ISL. Okay. Um, uh, there were only two people that turned in the test corrections, and neither of those people were one of the ones that actually like needed to do this. Um, which reminds me, the two people that did turn in their test corrections, I think it was you. Um, did you turn in test corrections? <laughs> I have them on my desk. I need your actual original test as well. So the paper that I scribbled all over and wrote all the scores, hand me that too. If you have it with you today, hand it to me. Um, if you don't, bring it the next time. Okay. That way I can add those points however I need to add them. Okay. Otherwise, I don't know how many to add. Okay. Um, okay. So for the overview for today. We only need to be working on that last problem from 2.5, and then we'll cover 1.6 part B. Okay. Once we're done with that, we're going to stop. I might have enough time to cover this one, but I don't want to try to cram it all in there. It's too much um, to absorb in just that short time. I think 2.5 itself is a lot to absorb. Um, so I definitely want to keep it a little bit spread out. Um, just FYI, I did move the class period, so we will not have class on Monday the 18th, okay? That's going to be your catch-up on homework day, okay? And as I looked up the homework scores for the last unit that we did, um, the average homework score from everyone was about a 66 to 67. So there's some people that have like an A and a B in their homework, and then a lot of people that are not doing part of any homework, and then there's some that are in that 60 range, okay, on their homework scores. Um, please keep doing the homework assignment until you have a good score. Don't just go in there, do whatever, and then you got a 20 and leave it at that, right? Keep working on it until you have that higher score on every single assignment, okay? That's how you know you're getting in all of that practice, right? That's how you know you're learning the material and you're being able to perform it. Okay, so make sure you keep doing those homework assignments until they're all good. Another thing, I think there was like two people that did all the homework and then they didn't do the review. The review is a homework score, so it will affect your homework average, okay? So make sure you're doing the reviews as well. The reviews also help you with preparing for the test, right? A lot of the problems are very, very similar, okay? So make sure that you're doing those reviews. Don't forget about them. Um, okay, I am going to have all, I think right now it says the 20th inside by this time, but I am going to change it to the Tuesday the 19th, okay? Um, I will change it to that night at 11.59 p.m., okay? Because then the test is going to be that Wednesday morning. Does that make sense? So we don't have very much in this section. It is one of the remedial sections, right, from 314 course. Um, so those don't usually have a whole bunch in them. After this last uh, unit for 314, there will be no more developmental stuff. All the next three tests after this test, the unit D test, all the next three are all going to be college algebra tests, okay? And so on your papers, you actually have your current college algebra grade, right? That's only including whatever you did on this unit one test and then whatever you did on this unit two test, okay? If, I don't know, I can't remember if somebody in here missed unit one, but if you did, your score may be a little bit off. Oh, I'll talk to you about that later. Um, but, because I didn't put a zero in there. If you put a zero in there, the score is more accurate, right? But if you leave it empty, it pretends like nothing's happening over there in Canvas, okay? So, the grade might look higher than what it actually is, so I don't know, we'll see. Um, but I'll talk to that person individually. Um, but you should have a good idea on your paper about how you're doing in the college algebra. So yes, we do want to get this one unit out of the way for the 314 class, right? And these concepts are going to help us in one of the college algebra units, right? Because all this fraction business is going to come back in another unit. In that unit, in college algebra, we're going to actually have to graph those functions, those fraction functions that you're seeing in that 2.5. We actually have to graph them. 
in another chapter. Okay, so it will come back. Knowing how to simplify it, knowing how to find your domains, things like that. That's all going to come back to us in another chapter. Okay. So let's go ahead and just to kind of recap on all that fraction business, right? And to um, to see some more fractions again before we jump into the next section. Okay. So I did read the last problem from P point five. Um, today. So let's just focus. This was a problem I had written down. And we didn't get to it the last class, but we're going to talk about it today. And so if you remember the strategy we talked about last class, if you can use that, what do we call it, the TP rule, right? You can use the TP rule, but only with two fractions at a time, okay? So I'm basically going to use that TP rule for these two. Once I know that answer, then I'll do the TP rule with that answer and this leftover one. Does that make sense? That's the game. So I'm going to have negative two times the right fractions denominator plus seven times the left fractions denominator over the two denominators multiplied together. And I could have put this x in parentheses, but didn't for some reason. And then just to be consistent, I'm going to keep this here. And just keep bringing it down until I'm done with all of this stuff. Okay. Now let's see, I'm going to distribute this guy. So minus 2x squared minus 2, and then that would be just plus 7x. And remember at the bottom, you want to keep them factored. You don't want to foil that in or distribute it in or anything. Oh. That Double check. I think I'm on the course, but I want to make sure. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now we're here, and I really can't do much with this. I could try to factor it, but I don't want to do that just yet. Um, but I just rearranged it so that it's in the correct order. However, here's the question. Do I need to apply the TP rule? Are those denominators different? The looks and reality are two different things, right? <laughs> they look different from one another, right? But are they actually equivalent? They are. So we don't need to apply that TP rule. I would have if it didn't match, but they actually do match. What happens if you factor this other denominator? You can factor out what? An X, and then you have X squared, and then just a one, right? So that when I distribute this X back in, I would get these two terms. And they do have the same denominator. So when they have the same, you don't need to do the TP rule, okay? If you do it, all that's going to happen is it's going to get, there's going to be a lot going on, and then you're going to have to factor everything and cancel anyway, okay? So let's just add them then. It's going to be these guys plus that guy all over the same denominator. What happens to that minus 2 and the plus 2? Mm -hmm. And so I have this now. Can this reduce? Mm -hmm. More importantly, though, because the front back is negative, I actually have to factor out of what? A negative x. And then when I do that, that'll become a positive 2x, and this will become a minus 7. If you're not sure if you factored out that negative x correctly, distribute it back in and see if you get what you were trying to factor, right? So negative times a positive 2x, I do get this, right? And negative x times a negative 7, I do get positive 7x, right? So it is factored correctly. 
then this x will cancel with this x, but you still have that negative there, right? Or do they like this negative? Uh -huh. The front right of the fraction. And so then this is the final answer. So I would have applied that CP rule again, but I just didn't need to in this particular problem. Okay. A lot of the problems the web assign are very similar. They only change certain numbers, which doesn't really change the kind of problem it is. It just changes what the numbers are going to look like at the end. Okay. So this same scenario should happen on your problem, where they actually do have the same common denominator after you've already combined the first two. Okay, so that was the last problem from 8.5. So today I don't actually have my front page with me, but the only thing on the front page is that summary where it tells us all the concepts we're going to cover. You know what I'm talking about? Right? But this is 1.6. Okay, so we're actually going to start with this one. Now, this whole section is about rational equations. So we learned in the last section how to simplify those weird fractions, how to add them, how to subtract them, how to multiply them, and how to divide them, right? You learned all the operations with fractions. However, now they're wanting us to solve these equations, okay? So we have to solve equations that have fractions in them. And I don't know how often, I get so confused between these class and my pre calc class because a lot of the stuff that we do in here, we do in pre calc. Um, we just don't have a whole lesson over it. I'm always just like, remember when? <laughs> and that's it, right? Um, so sometimes I get a little like, did I cover this in this class or did I not? I don't know if we've talked about it, but anytime you're trying to solve a equation that has a fraction in it, the first thing you need to do is get rid of all the fractions. And the way you get rid of all the fractions is by multiplying by the LCD. And it doesn't even need to be the least common denominator. It just needs to be a common denominator, okay? If it's a common denominator, what happens is, is that all the denominators should be able to reduce into it, okay? So if you're looking at a fraction like this and you see the two denominators, this one has like one that doesn't really affect anything, right? If you don't know what the common denominator is, just multiply all the denominators together and that's your common denominator, okay? Sometimes it will actually be the lowest common denominator and sometimes it won't, but that's okay. It's not gonna affect your, your solutions, okay? So when I'm solving this, um, I am gonna have to find a common denominator and I see an X, I see an X minus two and I see a one. When I multiply all those together, this is what you end up with as your common denominator, right? The one is not going to change anything if it when I multiply by it, but x times x minus 2 is this expression, okay? She just didn't actually multiply together, okay? So what they're going to do is they're going to take that expression and they're going to multiply it to every single fraction, okay? To every single um, term here. So you have this fraction, which is one term, you have this fraction, which is one term, and then you have this constant, but it's one term. Okay. And all three of those terms have to get multiplied by this LCD. Now they put it on the left-hand side. Me, I don't usually put it on the left-hand side, but that's just a choice. Okay. You're still doing the same thing, right? Whether I put this over here or I put it behind the two over X, does it make a difference? Not really, right? It's just how I prefer to do it versus how the book just did it. Okay. The important thing is, is when you do put the LCD times every term, you have to cancel out your denominators. Remember, that was the whole point of it, right? Is to cancel those denominators. So cancel it. This one will cancel with this guy. Um, this X minus two, the whole thing will cancel with this whole X minus two. And this one really didn't have a denominator to cancel anything, did it? Okay. So if I go to the next page, all they did was write what you had left over 
And notice that there's no more fractions anymore. All the bottoms got canceled out. Right? So this is just rewritten. Sometimes people do this step. Sometimes they just go straight into this step. It's completely up to you. Okay. Notice this information over here on the side. Why is that there? Didn't you just cancel something? You canceled two things, didn't you? And they already trained you in the last P5 section that whenever you cancel something, you have to talk about those domain restrictions, right? So I canceled out an X, didn't I? So when X equals zero, that means zero is one of those restrictions, right? Here I canceled out X minus two. But if I set X minus two equal to zero, I get X equal to what? Two. So those are my two restrictions, zero and two. I cannot have zero and I cannot have two. And normally you can look at the original problem, right? What happens if I get zero as an answer and I try to put it in there? It's gonna give me a defined grade. It's definitely not gonna equal this side, okay? And if I put the two in here, this side of fraction is gonna be undefined, right? So it's definitely not gonna equal whatever was supposed to be over there, okay? So it's just letting you know about those restrictions. I don't talk about the restrictions until the end. They put them there as soon as they cancel them, they roll for restrictions, okay? Um, for me, I usually don't do that until the very, very end, okay? Then from here, you just distribute, right? So two times X, two times negative two. Here, it looks like they did a lot, but they didn't put it in here. Let me write it in there. So they actually did 3x and then distributed this minus x, okay? Remember, you cannot combine, you cannot subtract before you multiply. Remember your order of operations, right? You have to do this multiplication before you can subtract these two things, okay? So that's negative x squared, and then this times this would make a positive 2x, okay? So that there's the negative x squared they had, and then 3x plus 2x is where they got this 5x from. They just didn't show it, so I wanted to make sure that you could see where it came from. Okay, once they have that, if you look at this equation here, what kind of equation is it? It's a quadratic because of that x squared, right? So then the goal is to get everything equal to zero, and I don't want a negative x squared, so I'm actually going to add x squared to both sides, and then minus the 5x on both sides. So when you do that, you do get the zero on the right-hand side, and you end up with the positive x squared, and then 2x minus 5x is where they got the negative 3x, and then the minus 4 just came down. Okay. From there, they factored it. If you cannot factor it, just because your skills are not fantastic, or you tried to factor it and it's not factoring, what is the other way you can find these two answers? Quadratic formula. So they did it by factoring, but if you cannot, you can also use the quadratic formula. Okay, I just want to make you aware, once it's a quadratic, you choose how you want to solve it. Or if you want to extract roots, which is not the favorite, right? <laughs> or you want to factor, which is usually the fastest, if you're good at it, right? And then if you can't, or you just, mind block, do the quadratic formula, okay? So they did actually factor it pretty easily here. And so then they just set each factor equal to zero. They do it different. I do them like side by side. They do one and then the other one, right? <laughs> it's just a style, that's all that is. But they do set one equal to zero and then they set the other factor equal to zero. And so they get these two solutions. As long as these solutions are not these numbers that you're not allowed to have, then they are actual solutions, okay? But if one of these answers was a two, that would not work. And that answer would not be in my final response, okay? Normally you wanna check them. I'm not going to check them every single time, but normally you wanna check them. So you always have to check them in your original. So 2 over 4 equals 3 over 4 minus 2 minus 1, right? Here you get a half. Here you get 3 over 2. What's 1 and a half minus 1? Isn't it a half? Right? So that one checks out. And then what was the other answer? Negative 1. So 
So two over negative one equal to three over negative one minus two. This gives me negative two. This gives me negative three. What is three over negative three? Negative one. And then it's negative one minus one, negative two. Yeah, so that one checks out as well. Okay. I don't do this every single time. All I do is once I have those two answers, I just make sure they don't hit one of the exclusions. Okay. Okay. Oh. I should have just read down here. <laughs> they checked it down here for us. Keep doing that. Okay, so here's one. Now, there. This one is one of those ones where I told you, if you use my strategy to find the common denominator, it might not be the lowest common denominator. Okay, because I can use. I'm actually going to do this problem twice. I can use the lowest common denominator or I can just use a common denominator, okay? The lowest common denominator here is actually 6x, and that's it. Because this can go into 6x, or I phrase it differently, 6x can be divided by this evenly, right? 6x can be divided by 3 evenly. And 6x can be divided by 6. But that only works if your brain thought that that was the LCD. Okay? If your brain is just not thinking about what the LCD is, you don't know what it is, you're looking at it, and you're like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> right? Just multiply them all together. If I multiply them all together, what do you get? What do you get? X times three times six. 18 X, yes. And so notice that it's different, right? But I'm gonna do it both ways so you can see that you get the same answer, okay? So if I actually use the lowest common denominator here, I would take this fraction and multiply it by that six X. I would take this fraction and multiply it by that six X. And I would take the last fraction and multiply it by six X. Again, this is my style. The book style likes to put the 6x over here in the front, right? That's just a style. Some people put it on the right sometimes and on the left other times. It doesn't matter. As long as you're multiplying each term by 6x. Okay. So here, the x will cancel, right? Here, the 3 will go in the 6 two times. And here, the 6 will cancel. And so what am I left with? I'm left with four times six minus five times two X and X times X. Does that look correct? I like to rewrite it again, but without all the people that got canceled away. Look good. You got two because um, three goes into six twice. Twice, yes. Mm -hmm. So I reduce these two guys. So basically, three goes three can divide into this, right? Aren't you dividing by three? Right. So six divided by three is the next. But as soon as you divide it by that three, it's gone. Okay. So don't forget to calculate. Okay. Or if you have problems, right? I don't have my fancy calculator, but if you do have a problem, all you have to do in your calculator is type in that five over three and then hit time six. And it will tell you the answer. That's wrong. Oh, it tells me the final answer. Uh -huh. What do I get when I multiply these two together? Uh -huh. And that's not what it was time ten. <laughs> so it gives you like the end answer, okay? So let's see, we're going to have 24, we're going to have 10, but with an X next to it, and we're going to have an X squared. What kind of equation is that? So I do want everybody with the X squared. Now, do we want to move the X squared over here to the left, or do we want to move these two terms to the right? Why? Right, you don't want this guy negative, right? You want to keep him positive, okay? 
So let's move the 10x and then let's move the 24. So we do get zero on the left and we're gonna have 10x and then minus 24. And I think this one actually does factor nicely. I think it's two and 12. But who has to be positive? The, the figure, right? Whatever this is, the final answer. Don't you always get the answer from the base number, right? So this one will be minus, so I can get a negative 24. So then if I set this factor equal to zero, you get x equal to what? Two. Two. And if I set this factor equal to zero, I get x equal to negative 12. All you have to do, this is where I was mentioning, I don't do the restriction part. I don't even fully check my answers. I have to way check my answers. I'll say another word, but <laughs> I halfway check my answers, right? All you have to do is make sure that none of these numbers make any of your denominators zero. As long as they don't make any of the denominators zero, they are good answers, okay? So I only really have one variable down here, right? And if I plug in two there, it's definitely not going to be zero, right? It's going to be two. And if I plug negative 12 in there, it'll be negative 12. It won't be zero, right? So both of these are good. Okay? And both of these will be part of your answer. So you don't have to check both whole things, but you do have to check both denominators. Okay? Now I'm going to do the same thing. I know it's going to be repetitive, but I'm going to do the same thing again, but using my strategy. Right? My strategy was don't even bother thinking about what the lowest common denominator is. Just get a common denominator. And the easiest way to do that is to multiply all the denominators together. Okay? So we multiplied all of these three denominators together and we got 18x. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this whole equation and multiply everybody by 18x. Okay, so x divided by x, what happens with those? They just cancel, right? What about 18 divided by three? It'll give me six. What about 18 divided by six? It'll give me three. So I end up with four times 18 minus five times six x and x times three x. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what that is. Let me see. Four times eighteen. Seventy-two. This is thirty x, and this is three x squared. I still have a quadratic, right? And this guy is still positive. So I'm gonna do the same thing and move those two guys over there. Okay. When I do that, this one's gonna have to get added over there, right? And this one's going to have to get subtracted over here. So those two terms should change signs when they move over, right? Now, when you're factoring this, you actually have to look for a GCF first. And there is a GCF. It's 3. And when you factor that 3 out, let me see, 72 divided by 3 is 24. I knew it was going to be 24, but I want to check. Okay. Isn't that exactly what you were factoring earlier? Right? So if I factor that, it'll be x minus 2 and x minus plus 12, just like we did. And then if you set each factor to 0, can 0 actually equal 3? No, so you don't get any answers from this factor. Okay? But if I set this one equal to zero, I get x equals to two. And if I set this equal to zero, I get x equal to negative 12, right? So you do still get the same exact answers, okay? So that's why I don't bother myself with trying to find the lowest common denominator. Sometimes it's, it's brain working. It's just like, I thought it was this, but it's not. <laughs> Don't even bother. Just multiply them all together and use that, okay? Okay. So let's look at this one. What would be the common denominators that I would have to use for this one? Let's look at 
There's the, everybody does that. What you just said, everybody confirms this at the very beginning. Everyone, even I did it. <laughs> everyone says that, that they like, oh, between five and 10, the lowest common denominator is 10. So then that means X plus 10 has to do it, right? That's what we're thinking in your brain, but it's wrong. <laughs> what if X was if X equals one? This would be 18 over six, and this would be 14 over 11. Is six and 11, is that the common denominator between those two guys? It's not, right? So in order for you to say this is the common denominator between both fractions, that would have to be the common denominator for both fractions, no matter what X was. So every X would have to tell me that that was the common denominator between these two numbers. And so the fact that I found even one that disproves that means you cannot say that this one is a common denominator, okay? But we have a strategy. What's the strategy without even so that you just avoid making that error altogether? Just put them together, right? Use them both as your common denominator. Okay. So my common denominator, maybe not the LCD, I don't care about the L, but my common denominator will be both the X plus five and the X plus 10. Okay. It's like kids when they learn words, right? <laughs> had it, had it is not a word, but <laughs> but they'll put things together because it's just building off of what they know. So I totally understand why everyone thinks that. I mean, I did too. So okay, so we're gonna take the first fraction and multiply it by that common denominator. Take the next fraction and multiply it by the common denominator. These problems do end up becoming really long horizontally. And then the one times the common denominator. That's not that I write kind of big either. But. So some guys are gonna cancel, right? This X plus five will cancel with that X plus five. This x plus 10 will wipe out that x plus 10. And there's no denominator here, so nothing should be wiping out, right? So I end up with 18 times that factor minus 14 times this factor. And then if I multiply by 1, I don't really need to write times 1, do I? I can just write x plus 5 and x plus 10. And so then simplify that before you decide what kind of function it is, okay? So for me, I'm gonna multiply in the 18. I'm gonna multiply in the negative 14. And then I'm gonna foil this out. So that's x squared plus 10x plus 5x plus 15. And so now if I am looking at all of that, right, there's no more parentheses. It is a quadratic, isn't it? So what I want to do is I want to move everybody over to the right-hand side. I think I need to clean it up before I do that. So it's just a simple one, right? So let me put those two together and get 4x. We'll put these two together and get, um, what do I get? 110? Sorry. I don't know, my brain does weird stuff sometimes. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> then over here, those two together, we 15, and we have this 50. So this guy is already positive, so I am going to move these two people over there to that side. And so then I will have how many x's? Seven, and how many constants? Negative six. 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 Negative six.
gosh, I'm gonna factor this. Now I'm gonna try to factor it because I think it can be factored pretty easily. But let me make sure. So 60 and the square root of that is seven point something. So I'm going to go down this line of numbers to set. So 1 times 60, 2 times 30, 3 times 20, 4 times 15, 5 times 12, 6 times 10, and 7 does not go into 60. Do any of those subtract to give you 11? And these guys, right? So then I'm going to say x and 4 x and 15. This answer in the middle is positive, right? So the bigger number has to be positive. But in order for me to get a negative when I multiply, what does this one have to be? Right. So then if I set that fraction equal to zero, I get x equals positive four. And when I set this fraction equal to zero, I get x equals negative. Just make sure that neither one of these numbers turns your denominators into zero, right? If I do four plus five, am I gonna get zero? If I do four plus 10, am I gonna get zero? Okay, so four is good. I'm gonna box that guy. Now negative 15, is negative 15 plus five zero? No. Is negative 15 plus 10 a zero? So this one is also a good answer. Now we need to do class. That's the last chapter. Have you ever heard, like, I know they talk about it on movies and social media and stuff. The stupid problems were like, the train is going east this many miles per hour, and then the other train is going this many towards the other train. When, when, at what point in time did they meet in the middle of things like that, right? Those problems were actually going to um, I would think it's funny when people get confused with those, because I actually know how to do that. But you'll know how to do that, too, once we get to that section. Okay. I thought that's what this one was, and I was like, what is this problem doing in here? This is not supposed to be in this section, but it's not. Okay, so it's a word problem and apparently it is going to have fractions in it, okay? And I do know that I am gonna have to use the same formula that I used in those other more complex problems, okay? The formula that you're gonna have to use is the fact that your distance equals your rate times your time, okay? You have to use that formula. And so normally we don't see it with all the words. We just see uh, D equals R D, right? So you have variables instead of um, instead of the whole words. Okay. Now you can manipulate this equation. If I wanted to know what R equals, I would have to divide by T, wouldn't I? So then I would have distance over T. If I took the same equation and I wanted to know what t was, I would have to divide both sides by r. So I would get that t equals the distance over r. Okay. So you can manipulate that, that equation. And the only reason why I'm mentioning it is because this section is all about fractions, isn't that? So more than likely, we're going to have to use one of these two versions. So let's go see what the problem says. It says an airplane runs a commuter flight between Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, which are 145 miles apart. Oh, this is one thing. Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington. It's not multiple places, right? So you've got Portland over here, and you've got Seattle over here, and they're how many miles apart? 145 miles apart. Okay. It says an increase of 30 miles per hour in the average speed of the plane decreases the travel time by 12 minutes. 
what initial average speed results in the decrease in travel time? Let's see. So we know that if whatever the speed is, I don't know the initial average speed, do I? Right, that's what they're asking me to find. So I'm gonna say, let X equal that initial average speed. <laughs> so when I'm done solving for X, I'll know exactly what they're asking for, right? Okay, so how do we put that in together? So apparently, in order for me to travel this 145 miles, I would have to go that average speed for a certain amount of time, right? The problem is, is you cannot solve an equation when you have two variables in it, right? You can only have one variable and then you can solve it, okay? But it does tell me that an increase of 30 miles per hour. So let's say I'm going still that 145 miles, right? I'm still going from one place to the other. But my speed is now going faster. So I'm going to add 30 miles per hour to my initial speed. Okay. But the travel time will actually take me how much? 12 minutes. It decreases by 12 minutes. So this would be T minus 12. And I don't know how much of solving systems of equations that you've learned, but you can use what's called substitution, okay? So I wanna know what X is, don't I, right? So I don't want T in this equation at all. And this equation looks a lot more complicated than this one. So this is the one I'm gonna have to solve don't want t in there. Could I take this equation and solve for t? Didn't we do that over here? Didn't we take that equation and solve for t, right? I can do it over here too. All I have to do is divide by the x. And we get that t equals 145 over x, okay? So instead of writing t over here, I'm going to use that expression that is equivalent to T, which is 145 over X. Now, does this equation have nothing but X's in it? It does. I mean, it doesn't look pretty, but it is, right? So let's see what happens when we FOIL. What happens when I take X times this fraction? X times that fraction. What will happen? We do. The x's will cancel, right? And so I'll just have the 145. What about when I do x times that term? Negative 12x. What about when I multiply these two terms? It will be a positive. And it's going to be some huge number, right? 30 times 145 is this huge number in the numerator and just x in the denominator. And then finally, the last two guys, so 30 times negative 12 is negative 360. Is this, now that the parentheses are out of the situation, is this one of those rational equations? It has an X in the denominator, right? So then how do you get rid of that denominator? Mm -hmm. It's the only denominator, right? So it's gotta be the common denominator. So then we're gonna multiply this guy by X, this guy by X, this one, this one, and the last one. All of them. And the only one that's actually going to cancel is the one that had it in the fraction, right? Everybody else actually gets multiplied by an x. So you have 145x equal to 145x minus 12x squared plus 4350 minus 360x. 
I'm pretty sure I'm going to need another piece of paper. I'm not going to be able to fit that in there. I do have some like terms I can combine, right? Can't I combine these two x's together on the right side? Actually, better yet, I'm just going to wipe this one out. I'm not going to do that. It, what kind of equation is this? It's a quadratic. And your x squared term is positive or negative? It's negative. So when it's negative, you have to move it, right? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write the 145x that was there just as it was. When all of these guys move over, what happens to them? If I want to write this guy on this side of the equal sign, what does it become? A negative. All of them will change signs, right? That's how you move them over. So this one will become positive 12x squared. This term will become negative 4350. And then this term will become positive 360x. And since I moved everybody to the left, I will have nothing on the other side anymore. And then I'm just going to simplify. So like these two just cancel the thing. So I have 12x squared. I want to write the x's next. And then this number last. Now you could do quadratic formula, but I have a feeling that this can be factored. Let me see if 4350 can be divided by 12. It cannot give me this. Let's see if it can be divided by. Oh no, I don't care what it can be divided by. If I can't divide it by 12, I can't make 12 go away, right? I don't like factoring when there's a number in front of the x squared. It's just me. Okay. Some people are good at it. I can be okay sometimes, but I don't particularly like factoring numbers when there's a number in front. Of and if 12 doesn't go into all three of these, I just stop and do the quadratic formula. Okay. So I'm going to use A equal to 12, B equal to 360, and C equal to a negative 4350. Okay. So I get X equals negative B plus or minus B squared minus 4 times A times C all over two times a. So I don't know what I'm going to get inside of there. I don't have my regular calculator, so I'm going to actually just try to do this. You might be able to type this whole thing in. If you can type in this whole stuff under the radical, let me know if you get the same number as I did. So you might not need to write this step right here in the middle, but let me know if you got the same number as me. Type in everything underneath that radical. I just want to make sure this is the correct number before I continue. It is the same. Okay, good. So then let me see if I can take the square root of that. Oh no, it's not nice. Does your calculator give you a square root of this? Like a nice one? Let's use your decimal. Okay, well then that's what it is. <laughs> let me see. 338400 and square root. I'm going to round it to four places just because I have no idea. Oh, it says round to one decimal place, but never round until your final final answer to one decimal place. So I've just put as many as I felt like I, should, I would need. And you get two answers, right? You get plus this number over 24, and then you get negative 360 minus this number. I'm not even going to compute the second one 
What happens when you do a negative minus another number? You get a negative answer in the top, right? And then you'll have a positive 24 at the bottom, don't you? What's a negative divided by a positive? A negative. Can your time, remember I'm doing my rate, my, my speed. Can my speed be negative? No, right? This one doesn't make any sense. Okay, so I didn't even need to find the actual number. I just needed to know that it was negative and it's bad. Okay. This one, though, I think will come out positive. So I'm going to take that number and I'm going to subtract 360. And then I'm going to divide by 24. And now is where I will round to the one decimal place and I get 9.2. And so I know it was miles and then it was miles per hour. So this one should be miles per hour. Actually, I am wrong. I screwed up big time. Oh, I screwed up big time. I don't think you know where I screwed up. It's not on this page. I'm gonna have to do this whole problem all over again. I'm not happy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I screwed up. Okay. The speed was in what kind of measurement? It's a good thing that I screwed up though, because that way you can avoid it when you're doing your homework, right? Miles per hour. Yes, the speed is in miles per hour. And my time is given to me in what? Minutes. That's an issue. Okay. Because now I don't know if my answer is in miles or minutes or a combination of the two, what is going on, right? So that's where I screwed up. When I plugged in 12 for T, I should not have plugged in 12 for T. I should have plugged in the number of hours for T, okay? 12 minutes is not 12 hours, right? So I cannot plug in 12 here. How would I figure out how many hours 12 minutes is equivalent to? Uh-huh. So this 12 minutes, I shouldn't even put T because I don't know what that is. But what I'm going to decrease by should be 12 minutes times uh, what is it? one hour over 60 minutes. So you're right. I do end up dividing. Let's see what that is. 12, yeah. 12 divided by 60 is 0 0.2. 0 0.2 hours. We are dealing with a section that has fractions, so I'm not going to leave that as a decimal. It's actually one fifth of an hour. Okay. So when I plugged in this 12, I shouldn't have plugged in 12. I should have plugged in one fifth. Okay. I am not the kind of person that just erases everything. I like to just fix it. So I'm going to put the one fifth here. I'm going to put the one fifth here and it is going to change two of my terms. So let's do the distribute again. That times that still does the same thing, right? The x is cancelled and we still get 145. But when I multiply x times this, I get negative one fifth x. Then 30 times this fraction is still the same fraction. But 30 times negative one fifth is not 360. I think it is six actually. 30 times or three divided by five, right? Yeah, six. But it should be negative. Because a positive times a negative will be negative. But now that you're looking at this, there's actually more than just one denominator, isn't there? There's two denominators. So if I want the common denominator, I have to multiply those together, right? So it actually should have been multiplied by 5x here. Okay. Let's see what that is. So that will change this. And I'm just going to totally get rid of this paper because everything on this piece of paper is wrong. <laughs> Okay, 
So 145 times 5x is going to be a big number, but it's all right. 725x. 725x. Again, here the 5 does cancel. So I end up with negative 1 times x times x. What is that? Negative 1 times x times x. Negative x squared. And here the x is cancel, but now I have to multiply that big number times 5. And then here nothing cancels, I just have minus 30x. Now this is better, but at the same time still crappy. I don't have a number in front of x squared, which is great, but I see this really huge constant and I'm like, oh well, no, but that's not gonna be nice to factor, right? So I am gonna move everybody over to this side. So we've got 725x that was already there. Then I'm gonna subtract that 725x. Then I'm gonna add x squared. I'm gonna minus this big giant number. And then I'm gonna add 30x. And then when I do that, I'll have nothing left over on the right hand side, right? Now these two will cancel. And so really I just have this quadratic equals zero, right? Now you could, that I would actually rearrange first, and it might be possible to factor it, but I really do not want to sit here and list all the factors of this giant number, because it is going to be a long list. So instead of trying to figure out how to factor that, I'm just going to go through the quadratic formula again. And hopefully this time we don't or I will know the actual answer. So let's see, A is equal to what here? And then B is positive 30, and C is this negative gigantic number. That number times four. Let me know if you get that number inside your Bible. It's a little different on the top. I don't want to break it wrong. Okay, now when I take the square root though, I don't get a pretty little radical. I get this number. And it does keep going, but I'm not going to um, round it. I don't want to round it until I'm at the very last step. So right now I'm just going to leave it in my car. Now we do know that we need to do both the plus and the minus. But just like we talked about the first time, no, get a rock. <laughs> this one is going to be that, right? Because you're going to have a big negative number, 300 and something, right? Divided by a positive number. This is going to give you a negative answer, okay? And your speed cannot be negative. Okay, so that one is already out. This is not your actual solution. However, this one, if I leave that number in my calculator, I can just hit minus 30, and then I can divide by two. And I actually end up with 133.2, it's 2396. But if I have to round it to one decimal, 
it's just 133.2. This makes a lot more sense for an airplane, doesn't it? <laughs> an airplane is not going to be going 90.2 miles per hour, right? <laughs> like I had in my previous attempts, okay? So this one makes a lot more sense. Yeah. And it's an average speed. It's, of course, the speed's going to fluctuate while it's in the air, but X was its average speed. <laughs> okay, we only have one more problem in this section. It is another word problem. And you actually have to know the formula before you can do that. Problem. So I will talk about the formula. Okay, so for this one, it talks about working together. Anytime it talks about working together, whether it's like two pipes in a pool working together, you know, two people doing an activity together, anything that talks about working together, this is the formula you want to use. It's one over the time the first person or thing plus one over the time for the second person or thing to do the same job equals one over the time that they do this job together. So you do have to be talking about the same exact task. Okay. So if it's two pumps or pipes draining a pool, they both need to be draining the pool, right? If it's two people washing dishes, they both need to be doing that same task washing dishes, okay? Here, it's saying, it doesn't even think it tells us the task. It just says a task. <laughs> so it says two people can complete a task in six hours. So which value is that? Is that the time of person one, the time of person two, or the time of them together? Just from that first sentence. Six is which of those three values? Six is the time together. Okay. Then it says working alone, one person takes two hours longer than the other to complete the task. So do I know how long it takes the second person to do it? Almost. Do it the other way around. So you have person one and you have person two, right? One of them is going to be two hours longer, right? So one of them is going to have a plus two, but you don't know how much the other one is, right? So you could say let X, because I don't know how long it takes the other person to do it, right? And then the other person would be X plus two, okay? So it's going to take them two hours longer to do it, right? So then now I'm just going to plug everybody in. So 1 over x plus 1 over x plus 2 equals to 1 over the time together, which was 6 hours. Before I go on, are both of these in hours? They are, right? So <laughs> we're good. I don't convert anybody. OK, this is one of those fraction problems, isn't it, right? So I need to get the common denominator. If I cannot figure it out, I'm just going to multiply them all together. And when I do, I get 6x, x plus 2, right? All three of these guys multiply together. And then I'm going to multiply that same thing to the second fraction, and then eventually to the last fraction. So in the first fraction, does anything cancel or reduce? This x will actually wipe out that x, won't it? Okay. So then we get 1 times 6, which is 6, and I still have to multiply by the x plus 2. Over here, the whole x plus 2 will cancel. And 1 times 6x is just 6x. 
here, sixes will reduce or cancel. One times x is just x, but I still have to multiply by the x plus one. I haven't done that yet. So now I'll multiply by the x plus twos. And I get these terms. And then I do have an x squared, so I will need to move everybody over. And since it's a positive x squared, I'm actually going to move all of these guys over to this side. Okay. So I'll have nothing on the left side. Those are the two people that were already on the right side. And when I move all of these three over, they should be changing signs. So this should become 6x, negative 12, and negative 6x. Right? These guys move over, they're going to change their signs. So let's see, this, this, and this are my terms. What do you get? Almost. And then the 12 is all by itself, so it's just minus 12. Now, unfortunately, that does not factor my C, right? If I look at the factors of 12, it's not too long of a list. That's it. But none of those actually subtract to give me 10, do they? Right? So I try, but it's not factoring for me. So I'm going to go to the quadratic formula. I'm actually going to use the piece of paper because I don't want to peek into this other title page. So I get x equal to negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac all over to a. So I get positive 10, and then I get 100 plus 48 over 10. What is the square root of 148? Decimal does keep going. I just put a dot dot dot. Just gonna leave it in my calculator. Now, what happens when I do ten minus twelve point something? I'm going to get a negative. And when you take that negative and you divide it by this positive 2, what do you end up with? A negative. And we already know that the amount of time that somebody's working cannot be negative, right? So this one is not going to give us a good answer. Okay. This one, though, will have a positive over a positive. So that will give us an answer. And we end up with 11.0827 dot dot dot. It said rounded to one decimal place. So it'd be 11.1. So one person's doing taking 11.1 hours, the other person will take how many hours? Right? This is time one, right? Time one was X. And we figured out that that was 11.1 .1 hours. Time two was X plus two. So how many hours does it take that person? 13.1 hours. And I'm writing both of them because in web assigned, normally it tells you, it asks you for both. It says, well, it does. It says, how long would it take for each person to complete the task? And this is the way they'll do it. They'll have like the faster person, and then they'll have slower person. 
Which number goes in which box? Who did it faster? The 11.1. And then the person that did it slower to 13.1, right? Okay. But this one should be where it will ask you like this faster and slower. So that's enough with the information. I want to double check the assignment and make sure there's nothing that's too different from what we've been doing. Just gonna go take a peek at it. As long as I don't see anything crazy in there, we'll we're done. Okay, that's not anything crazy. Couldn't you just square this and square that, right? Or you could also do it another way. What do you do when you have something squared and then that same thing by itself? Isn't that one of those quote unquote quadratic types, right? So you can substitute, you can use you. I actually want to do that one because that one's important. <laughs> so let me write down with that one. And if I have time, please, if I don't, we can do it. The next class, okay. But I just want to have a main plan. So number one, I definitely want to look at. Just writing it down. I'm not going to do it just yet. I'll see if there's any other ones. Number two, we did do one like number two, so we're good with number two. Number three, we did do one like number three. If you don't know what the LCD is on number four, just multiply X times X squared. What do you get? X cubed. If someone multiplier multiply by X cubed, okay. You'll still be able to factor out a GCF. You'll still be able to set each factor equal zero. It won't be anything weird, okay. For number five, you actually use nine and then X plus eight parentheses, right? You just multiply those together for number five. Your common denominator would be nine times this guy in parentheses. This problem is a lot like ours. Be careful with that 12 minutes. You cannot plug in 12, right? What do we have to plug in instead of 12? We plug in one fifth, right? So make sure you don't plug in 12 for your five. Okay. But definitely use our example for that one. The only thing that really changed was the model for hours. We had 30, this one has 20. And then this one actually gave you the formula already. So you didn't even have to develop it like we did. So then it says, find the time it takes the, for you to tile the floor alone. So what the hell is T? Okay, you tile the floor in T hour. So basically just solve for T, right? And then you'll know that answer. And they already gave you the formula, so you're good. It says your friend can tile the floor in six hours working together. That should be this guy right there. A guy on that side should be the time together, right? So that's where that six is going to go. Okay. You can't have T's and Y's in your equation. You can only have T's. That's it. So plug in that six right here and you'll be able to solve it. And then this one is very much like the one. So fantastic, we only have one this weird. Okay, so for this one, it is a quote unquote quadratic type. So basically what I would do is I would say, let you equal that stuff in the parentheses. Okay. And then this would become two u squared minus three u minus two equal to zero. Now, if you can factor that, factor it. If you cannot factor it, then do the quadratic formula. I, however, can factor this pretty easy. And it factors into that. If you cannot factor it, you can get the same two answers for you by doing the quadratic formula. But if I set each one of these factors equal to zero, I get u equals negative one half, and I get u equals two. But 
but negative one half and two are not my answers, right? The problem had X, so I need to tell them what X equals. So then you have to go back and back up. Since that's what U was equal to, I just put it back in that fraction. Now, for this fraction, you do have to multiply by both two together. So I have to multiply by two and x plus four. And then the x plus fours would wipe each other out over here, and the twos would wipe each other out over there. So I end up with two times x and negative one times the x plus four, which is just two x and negative x. Minus four. This is not a quadratic anymore, is it? So I do not need to do the formula or get it equal to zero. I just need to move my x's to one side and then divide by my coefficient. Then we come over to the other equation, and that one only has one denominator. So I'm just going to multiply by x plus 4, and that's it. Because it's a totally different equation, right? So it will cancel here, but it does not cancel anything over here on the right side. So I end up with x by itself and 2 times this. So when I distribute, I get that. And then I'm going to move my x's over. And then I'm going to divide by my coefficient. And I get negative 8. Remember, you do not have to fully check the problem. You just need to make sure that these numbers do not make your denominator 0. Okay? So if I plug in a negative 4 thirds here, this is not going to be 0. It could be a fraction, but not a 0. Okay? And they're the same denominator, so I don't really need to check both. If I plug negative 8 in there, I'm not going to get zero, right? So both of these answers are for solutions here. Okay. But you do have this as an example. Now, that's one way. There is another way. It may or may not be this lengthy or I don't know. It might be shorter. I don't know. We'll see. The other way to do this problem is to just square and just multiply. So if I take this and I actually square both of these guys, and I take the three and I multiply that, right? Parentheses, right? I can just write 2x squared. So far, so good. And then what's the common denominator between the two guys? If you can't see it, what do you do? Or if you're even just second guessing yourself, you multiply them together, right? What happens when you take two of these things times another one? What happens when you take x squared times another x? You get cubed, right? Yeah. So we're going to multiply by x plus 4 cubed. And I have to do it to the 0, too. Everybody gets multiplied by this LCD. Now here, two of them will cancel, leaving me with just one. Here, one of them will cancel, but leaving me with two. Here, none of them will cancel. And what is zero times anything? Zero. However, there is a GCF for all three of these terms, and it is that x plus four. But how many of these x plus fours can I factor out? Just one, because this one only has one, right? So when I do that, I have 2x squared 
minus 3x times the extra one minus 2 times the extra 2. Right? The problem is just as long as it is the other way. So I'm going to have 2x squared minus 3x squared minus 12. And here, if I boiled this out, I would get x squared plus 8x plus 16. But I still have to distribute this minus. You see how I got x squared plus 8x plus 16? So I get minus 16x and minus 32. And then I'm going to combine all my like terms inside there. So these actually will cancel each other. And I only have negative 16x. And what do these two give me? Negative 50 or no, 42. Is that right? 44. Okay, so then I have to set this factor equal to zero. I have to set this factor equal to zero. I'm not going to go all the way through it, but here you get negative four. Can negative four be an answer? Why? It'll make the denominator zero. So this is bad, okay? And I'm guessing, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but I'm guessing that if I did go through this whole thing, I would get these two answers of my other two answers. Okay. I don't do it, so it's going to be really super fast. Okay. <laughs> okay. All over two times to say. Let's see. Four times. Three times forty four. I don't see something to point out, but I'm getting like a negative number. That I multiply these guys, I got negative 3x squared, right? When I multiply these guys, what should I have gotten? 12x. <laughs> and now I have, that's okay. So this should have been 12x, right? So then that's going to change some stuff up a little bit. This is probably why I wasn't getting those numbers correctly. So I actually have to combine these x's together, which gives me, what, 28? And then the constant is just going to stay under right? So let's see. That should be 28. And that should be 32. So minus 28 minus 28. So let's see now. What is 28 times 28? It's 784. And then 4 times 3 times 32 is 384. So I get 28 plus or minus 400. And the square root of 400 is 20. 
And so we get 28 plus 20 is 48 over negative 6. And 28 minus 20 is 8 over negative 6. This reduces to negative 8. And this reduces to negative 4 thirds. And we're told the same two answers as the other page. And it's, to me, this one's longer and harder. Because <laughs> I messed up, right? Like twice. So be careful with this one. Okay. This is the much preferred answer. But if you draw blanks and you don't think to use the substitution, it can be done the other way. Okay. And I always like to show both the ways because sometimes people's brains just go in different directions, right? Not everyone thinks exactly the same. Okay. But it can still be done. As long as you're not breaking any rules and you're still solving what it is you have, and for every step, you're good. Okay. So that's it for this section. Tomorrow we will cover the last section and then hopefully over the weekend and then including on Monday, right? You have that extra day. Get as much of the homework as you can do. Try to do that review as well um, over the weekend and on Monday. And then Tuesday we'll go over the review together. So if you have any questions, that's okay, we'll cover that. Okay. But tomorrow will be the last day of the podcast. Thank you.